Hey guys, welcome to Pain Free Pals. Emily here. Miriam is away this weekend, but this week's very special guest is Amanda Kerpich, who is a, everyone bear with me, she's a nutrition RD certified diabetes care and education specialist. And she was my CDE back in the day um, at Columbia, the Naomi Diabetes Center. So welcome, Amanda. Thank you. So excited to be here. Literally, this has been like months of me trying to plan because anyone who's ever been on a guest a guest on the show knows that either you get emailed like months before or last minute because I have zero to 100 in terms of how I'm planning. So I'm glad this finally worked out, Amanda. Me too. <laughs> Apologies for me being all over the place, but this is real. This is me. So for this week's episode, in case uh, Amanda's title didn't didn't give a nod to it. Um, we're going to discuss all things diabetes type 1 and type 2. You're going to be thinking, oh, that's what this podcast is about. Well, yes, but um, from a CDE perspective and a nutrition perspective. So um, like no trigger warning really necessary. We're not going to be talking about any types of eating disorders or anything like that, but um, we're going to get into some of the the carb counting, that type of thing um, that comes along with diabetes, especially for those newly diagnosed listeners. Amanda is the bomb and she really helped me through the beginning of my diagnosis. Even though I guess I hit you up, I hit you up. LOL. I was your patient um, when I was an adult, Emily at Naomi Diabetes Center. Naomi Berry, I always mess that up, was my uh, care specialist for the first like two years, I want to say. But Amanda- yeah, That's about right. Yeah, Emily's great too. I miss Emily if she's listening out there. Hello, Emily. Uh, but welcome, Amanda. Thanks. So yeah. usually we start off with someone's diagnosis story, but Amanda is pancreatically capable, so we won't hold that against her. Um, but just can you kick us off a little bit with some of your your background in with diabetes specifically? Yeah. So I am, like Emily said, a dietitian. Um, so I went through traditional dietitian training, which is an undergrad um, in nutrition and then an internship for nine months um, in New Jersey. Um, and through that, you go through all different areas of nutrition. So I worked in inpatient hospitals. I worked in rehab settings, worked with children, worked with adults. And my first job outside of that was working in a subacute pediatric hospital in Maryland. And there, um, one of the reasons I took that job was to be able to work with people with diabetes. So initially, I worked for probably the first five and a half years of my career working with kids with diabetes and slowly transitioned to working with adults with diabetes. Um, so while I was in grad school in Boston... I worked with kids and adults, um, kind of covering different areas of the hospital while I was in school. Um, and then finally, post-grad school, worked at Joslin Diabetes Center in Boston for almost eight years. Um, oh, and wow. then while I was there, worked primarily with adults and some teens, and then went to Naomi Berry Columbia, um, at Columbia, where I met Emily, um, <laughs> among other big clients. Um, and I worked there for almost, I think, almost three years, if I have that right, maybe almost four years. Um, yeah, it was almost four years, actually. Um, so I was wow, there. time flies. Yeah, right? Um, so yeah, so I worked in those spaces. So basically, over the course of my career, it's been about 19 years working um, with clients with different nutrition diagnoses, but most of the time um, throughout those 19 years, I've had spent working with clients with diabetes. So type 1, type 2, and everything in between. Um, Actually, one of the most notable things about man working with clients with diabetes that I noticed was when I was in my internship, I had the privilege of working with a physician down in Princeton, New Jersey, um, actually right outside of Princeton. But he was, um, I spent a day working with the physician, and one of the questions he asked me at the time was, how many types of diabetes are there? And this was after seeing a numerous amount of clients with him. And it, the answer was sort of, I guess... Um, he was looking for totally different types, like in the sense that every person's diabetes is different and that there are multiple different types and there's all these intricacies between clients. And so really looking at it from a patient perspective, which I found really helpful over the course of my career, um, just in trying to look at where people are coming from, because it's true that a lot of these different types of diabetes present 
differently for each client and each person. I love that. I wish, I mean, I feel like that's like a big reason why you and Emily were two of my favorite CDEs. I think that obviously it's something that we talk about a lot on the podcast, but just because you have the same type of diabetes doesn't mean you have similar diabetes. Um, Everyone has obviously their own their own battles and their own way that they manage the disease. But also we learned in our one of our last episodes that there are so many different types of diabetes, including Modi, yes. um, which I had I didn't know anything about. But also before I was diagnosed, I didn't really know much about type one either. I only knew about type two. So um, it's just it's wild that from like a patient perspective, there's no there, – you, whatever information you have about diabetes is usually just from life, not from school, obviously, unless you're in the healthcare field. But even then, it's usually just type two. So it's great that you had that doctor that that sat you down. That's so cool. I feel like that that really makes a lot of sense to me. <laughs> yeah, it was really cool to have that perspective from the early on. Um, because I think the thing that is so clear is, yeah, you can learn about all of this stuff in school, in a hospital, from a book. But really what I've learned the most from is what clients tell me. And so when I've been able to pass information or a perspective on to other clients, it's often what I've learned from my clients and my patients and my the people that I know that have diabetes. So right, because books can only teach you so much because, yeah, you know, A1C, <laughs> yeah, a, a million percent. Um, and I still find, and even, you know, during COVID times, people going to the doctor and getting diagnosed with type one or type two, it's just, it's such a mammoth or any of the types, it's such a mammoth diagnosis. So people are coming into this already freaked out. Um, even if you've had it for 30 years, um, and things don't phase you like they used to, there's still no day is the same with diabetes. Um, so I don't know. I think that it's great having a uh, CD or just any type of healthcare professional in your life that is able to understand that. And unfortunately, I think that's kind of few and far between, um, at least in my experience at the beginning of my diagnosis before I found my way to the Naomi Berry Diabetes Center. Um, so, hello, my dad's calling me. Sorry. <laughs> my dad's going to listen to this episode and he'll know exactly when this was. Uh, anyways, moving forward. I, I love that whole mentality, but in terms of what you've noticed, like what are some of the takeaways from a nutrition perspective that you've noticed across all types of diabetes with your patients in terms of carbs? Because I think that's such a, I know that's a general question, but I know I've always been pretty scared of carbs um, just because I know at certain times of day, my blood sugar will, obviously I'm more resistant than others, but it wasn't until I started looping that I really got more comfortable with giving myself, you know, like having a milkshake once every few months or, you know, kind of living my life and managing bigger doses of insulin. So like, what's your takeaway with kind of the whole mentality of low carb versus leading a normal carb life? (laughs) And what is a normal carb life? Right. right? Um, yeah. I can feel you cringing on the other side of this. You're totally fine. No, this is oh, such a loaded topic, right? This comes up on a daily basis for me with clients, and I read enough about diabetes in the space. So I know not everything that's out there, but I see a lot. Um, and I've always been in all foods fit mindset, um, whatever that means. Um, I've never really promoted with clients that they have to be low carb. Um, I know that's sort of controversial in all spaces. Um, And the reason is because when we think about how the pancreas works, that's what's broken. That's what's broken, not working, doesn't make enough insulin. Lots of things in the pancreas with diabetes often still work fine. So there are other hormones that the pancreas produces that work just fine. But this insulin piece, which is huge, um, <laughs> this is the diabetes base, right? Um, that doesn't work. And it doesn't work differently in type 2 and type 1, right? So in type 1, it's autoimmune. You don't make insulin, um, or at least very, very many amounts of insulin, if any. In type 2, you make insulin, at least in the beginning of the diagnosis, but it's not being utilized properly. And so the reason we have this carb focus is because insulin is what helps the body both digest or sort of process and absorb carbohydrates. And so if you 
are going to eat carbohydrates, you need the right amount of insulin at the right time, which is exhausting doing that from out here. <laughs> really? um, yeah. So when the pancreatic capable people, <laughs> the rest That's of just you. That's something fun I say. It's okay. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> I might butcher it a little bit, but I like it. But um, <laughs> when you don't have diabetes, your body does all of this from the inside and you don't think about necessarily the impact of carbs in your diet. Um, certainly the rest of the world can be fairly diet centric as well. And so sometimes they think about those things, but um, when we get to diabetes, we think about it a lot because those are, those carbohydrates are what we have to pay attention to in order to properly regulate our insulin levels if we can. Um, and so I'm not opposed to the concept or unaware that if you follow a lower carb diet, the insulin can be easier to manage. But I'm all for sustainability and I'm all for making sure that you're living your life in the way you feel good. And it's not easy to do that. A Um, thousand percent. Sometimes some people find it easier than others and they, and I'm not going to argue if that's a choice that you make, that you can't do that. And I work with clients that do do that. But I think most people find that they're, they can get, optimal management of their diabetes and still consume carbohydrates in all different ways. Um, And I think that's the part that we have to help people with. That's really what I focus on is like, what do you want it to look like? Because you have choices, you have options. It doesn't need to look black and white. Um, And for everybody, what that looks like, how your body responds to different types of carbohydrates is different. No two people digest pizza the same way. There are similarities. <laughs> we see a lot of challenges with pizza, for example. Um, insulin pumps used to, when they first came out with like the extended bolus on an insulin pump, it was called a pizza bolus. Um, that was it's what still they the icon. It. Yeah, it's yeah. still the icon I use for on my uh, yeah. DIY loop. It's a pizza versus like a candy versus or fruit, if you want. It's <laughs> pizza the, versus the rest of the world, right? <laughs> literally. Or honestly, though, it's um, I think one of the greatest takeaways in seeing a CBE, whether you're newly diagnosed or just for a refresher, is that the actual science behind it isn't something that I think a lot of people think about. Like, you know, after a few years, you kind of just get in the same um, rhythm, if you will. Like, okay, I know that this makes me spike after four hours versus this makes me spike after 30 minutes um, of eating, you know, like an orange versus a slice of pizza. But it's the factors that are contributing to the spike versus uh, the, the extended period of spike that can really teach you how to eat those certain things without spiking, if you will. So like, I think what I learned the most from you and from Emily was that I could have, um, you know, maybe a smaller piece of cake, but I would have that with like, I feel like I can feel, this is probably not a good advice for anyone listening, but you would just add more protein or more fat um, to kind of delay a spike like that. And I mean, I hope that's still right. That's how I live my life, but yeah, <laughs> to an extent. No. And I mean, I think that's it, is like understanding how foods affect you is the key, right? So if someone's eating something and they think, okay, I'm seeing this response and I have no idea why, that's way more frustrated, frustrating than looking at something and saying, okay, I know what this is going to do, or I have some general idea and I have some general way to handle this. It's still not going to go perfectly. And perfectionism in diabetes is probably something we should drop um, because I love to tell people and try and explain to them that if you don't have diabetes, if you were to wear a CGM, a continuous glucose monitor, you will look and see that you're not getting a straight line with your glycemic control. You're just not. And so why would we want that for somebody with diabetes? Why is there a need for that? When it's that's just not an added natural. burden. Right. And so right. there's going to be blips. There's going to be challenges. And there's going to be things you're going to choose to eat that aren't going to give you the optimal response that you were looking for. But we can work with that. If you want to eat it more often, we're going to learn from it. If you want to eat it as a special occasion, doesn't matter. And sometimes, yes, because sometimes it just makes you feel not so great. <laughs> um, but those are the kinds of things that we look at so that. of the time, 80% of the time, we're getting where we need to be. And the rest of it is kind of 
extra. Now a word from one of our sponsors. Hey Miriam, have you heard of the diabetes app? I feel like I've heard about it, but I don't know what it is. It's this super cool app that allows you to connect with other diabetics based on type of diabetes in your age. It has tons of resources for us pancreatically impaired pals and can even help you find healthcare professionals. Wait, that sounds amazing. And it's all one app? Yep. Go to the app store and download it for free. I already signed up and you should too. Ooh, downloading it now. Now, back to the episode. Right, because as long as you're hitting your goals, it's – uh. You know, like the, the point of living with diabetes is you don't want to get burnt out, which kind of brings me to my next question, because I know you've worked with a lot of people over the years and have probably seen lots of different forms of burnout, um, or at least the concept is a very buzzy term these days. But I've only had diabetes for s- pretty much seven years to the month, um, I think, at this point. Yeah, seven or eight. I think it's seven. Let's go with seven. um it's uh I've definitely gone through periods I think in the last year where I've just felt so exhausted from dealing with it but luckily for me I have amazing resources therapy's great um also I have Miriam and you know all the listeners who are going through similar things who always reach out but when you try to to live your life at a certain you know with so many numbers kind of making you feel worthy or unworthy of eating something like that is a very slippery slope. So with burnout, there's so many different forms of it. And I just want to get your opinion on what do you find helps people the most from a CVE perspective when they're suffering from diabetes exhaustion? Yeah, it's super common. Um, And you're right, like any length of diabetes, I think most people, when they've had diabetes for about a week, are done. Um, so <laughs> it's exhausting. You it know, is. It's, it's so many numbers. And then also you feel, I think it's, there's the psychological aspect, but the physical aspect of like just not feeling great after a roller coaster day. Exactly. Um, yeah. So that's, yeah. that's and my it's, two cents. I'll let you talk now. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Sorry. Yeah. No, it's totally, it's the full-time job you didn't ask for. And most of us want to have the full-time job on top of this, right? Um, You don't get paid for diabetes, unfortunately. You do not, and you can't leave it behind. I remember an analogy someone used one time was like kind of carrying the suitcase of diabetes to the airport and like you can't leave it. Um, It really will push back. And that's, I think, the hardest thing. It's like you don't get a break. Um, And so I think the key, and twofold, I think the key when we're in this space, regardless of what way you're managing your diabetes, you want to look at what is the bare minimum you can do to get the optimal management control is that word we've used for so long. It's still in my head, but language (laughs) does matter. Um, It's okay. We will hold it against you. (laughs) But regardless, it's like, what is the minimum we can do from a input of what you're doing as a client or a person with diabetes and the biggest output that you get from that? Um, and so we look at the types of ways you're using to manage it. Are there better tech, better tools, better technology, better options in that space? And is some of the technology burning you out? Um, right. Continuous glucose monitors are fabulous. They've been around for a good number of years. They're getting better and better, but it's a ton of information. And because of that, a lot of people, that actually burns them out. And so sometimes it's putting it down. And only looking at it a few times a day because most of the time, every time we look at our numbers or we look at treatment decisions, I guess what I should say is every time you look at a number, technically you're thinking, I need to do something with this. So the more times you look at it, the more times in the day you're thinking, I have to be doing diabetes management. And so how do we turn that down? How do we turn that noise down? Um, And so you're managing it in smaller increments of your day. Because we can't ignore it all together. We know that. But we don't need to do as much, maybe, as we are. And so there's some line of finding that balance of what is, what can we do, and what do we need to do, and what can we put down for a little while. Um, I love that. That's, and so yeah. that's kind of, and for everybody, that looks really different. Right. There's and, no one size fits all with diabetes or burnout. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, the key with burnout is to minimize the extreme of it, right? So we don't need to say that you can't be burnt out because that's not true. That's not real life. That's um, not how you fix it either. Year. Yeah. I think right? everybody's burnout this year. So right. it's a level of, but how do you get it to a point where this is something I can handle 
and where do you grab support? You're absolutely right about that support piece. Like who can you tag in to help you with these pieces? Friends, relatives, therapy, all of those pieces. Because I think that's really key. There's actually a book called Diabetes Burnout that's been around for a really long time, but um, Bill Polonsky wrote it. Um, and clients have read it. It's fabulous. We'll link to it. Yeah, on the, so on it's the a blog. good resource in that space if you feel like you're not sure if even what you have is burnout. <laughs> um, right. It's defined well through there. But yeah, support is key. And behavioral support in diabetes is key because chronic illness is exhausting. There's no way around that. Yeah. And I think that a lot of times when you have diabetes and you're seeking medical, I mean, you have to have medical help, whether that's through just getting a prescription for insulin or, (laughs) um, you know, just actually going the extra step and going to a diabetes therapist or whatever it is that that you need. It, It sometimes can feel a little ostracizing when your care, when you're healthcare professional doesn't also have diabetes, but you have to think of it on the greater scheme because you can't only see diabetic healthcare people. Like that's just not how it works. And I think that for me, sometimes that contributes to my burnout because it's like, okay, well, you don't, like, I know you know how to care for people with diabetes, but you, you don't know what it's like to like wake up, not get a good night's sleep when you're like 20, how old am I now? 27. And like, you don't have kids, but you're waking up like six times a night. (laughs) It's like SOS. But I think that that's where um, sometimes it can feel a little hard to seek help and that can lead to burnout. So this is just my my PSA that there are people with diabetes and that work in the diabetes field, but there are professionals that are willing to listen and are not a one one size fits all for diabetes. So that is my two cents on that. But that's a valid two cents. Yeah, it's I don't have diabetes. And I do appreciate that there is a different approach for someone who's lived in this experience. Um, But I think there are people that listen better and understand better. Right. Um, They're allies. And I think, yeah, because, well, and it's tricky, right? Because we don't ask for that in other professions, but I totally appreciate why we ask for that in diabetes. Um, And I think that is something that, you know, I've worked in this space for 19 years. So I have a decent amount of understanding. I'm still not someone who's lived with this and I've worn pumps and I've worn CGMs and I've tested my glucose. I've done things to enhance my experience, but it's still not the same as having diabetes. And so I do think it's important to have a mix and that's, you know, a lot of these communities, a lot of spaces exist to connect with other people who do have diabetes because I think that's important, but, and also, as things are being designed, and this is the other part of the burnout piece, it's important that technology be designed in a way that reduces work. And most of the time, you know, the primary focus is we want to make the numbers better, right? So that's the primary focus of most technology and most diabetes advances. How do we get faster insulin? How do we get insulin to work better? How do we get devices to talk to each other? But if it's putting more work on the client, that's never going to be successful piece. And so I think understanding that as a provider, understanding what devices work better for which people is huge. And so, you know, asking that of your providers too, asking your providers to, and again, that's putting more on you. That's not (laughs) necessarily fair in the space, but finding providers who do that maybe. Finding places where those providers exist and asking within the community where people are having better, you know, better experiences because they exist. I think, yeah, not to cut you off. I just, I want to, I mean, I'm not suggesting anyone only seek diabetic healthcare providers. I think more of what I'm trying to say is what I loved about Amanda's care for me is I vividly remember sitting in your office um, and an alarm was going off and you were like, oh, sorry, I'm wearing a pump today to try and figure this out. And I was like, shut up. I was just like floored at the the above and beyond. And for all the doctors and CVEs listening, I'm not saying you have to poke and prod yourself just to get to know your patients, but it just kind of shows me that there are allies and there are healthcare professionals that are willing to go out of their way to try and understand what you're going through. And we don't need to only have one type of diabetes or only have any form of diabetes to understand what it's like going through with a chronic illness. And you never know what invisible illness some person is dealing with. So 
I think what I'm trying to say is it came out probably the opposite, but what I'm trying to say is that there are healthcare professionals out there that do put you first. And um, this is just my love letter to Naomi Berry, but um, it's specifically Amanda and Emily. I need to connect with Emily. I'm like one day in the far future, we should just all get drinks if that's legally allowed. But um, <laughs> I, yeah. So Amanda has literally, I can vouch for that. She has tried on many a pump. <laughs> and CGM for sure. Yeah. Back in the day when I was in my internship, my project for that rotation, for my diabetes rotation, they handed me all the current pumps at the time, which mind you was like Decitronics and Medtronic. And I don't actually even think I, there was some other pump, but it was a long time ago. It was kind um, of Animus or something. No, Animus wasn't around yet. Oh, wow. Um, I'm pretty sure Animus came shortly after that um but yeah they literally handed me the pumps to learn all the button pushing so that I can make cheat sheets for when clients patients called in in the middle of the night and pump failure they were taking patients off the pump because they didn't how to help them get it sorted so oh my god I had all these beeping pumps and I had to learn how to program them <laughs> <laughs> well I, I mean that's just kind of like the extra step because I know when we think of CVEs we think of and nutritionists we think of like kind of the overarching how they can help me but I guess you know you have a lot of other patients and you have to manage or help educate all these people and I think especially with uh I mean type one's diff- a different the type one and type two are different in the way that you manage um there's no there's no real argument there, but I think that there is a lot of stigma that goes along with type two. And as someone who doesn't have type two, I can only talk so so much about it, but I know I feel like I was greatly um, uneducated in either type of diabetes. And I know you've done a lot of work with type two. So for all the type twos out there that are listening, Amanda is a great resource, but also <laughs> Um, what are some of the nutrition perspectives? Actually, let me rephrase this. I'm going to pivot a little bit here. I, mostly because we're already at 26 minutes and I have like one burning nutrition question to ask you. And I think this is going to get like a lot of hate for me, but I'm still going to ask it. What are your thoughts on the keto diet? (laughs) Yeah. So that goes along that low carb diet thing, doesn't it? Yes, but it's very high in fat. And as diabetics of any type, um, we typically have a precursor or not a precursor, but we have to be careful about our cholesterol, right? Yep. Yeah. So my thoughts overarching and yeah, you might get a lot of hate. I might get a lot of criticism on this as well. You don't, but have, you don't have to discuss it, but I just totally need fine. from a nutrition perspective, not a personal preference. I yeah, no. And I don't have any problems discussing these things. Um, so keto in general is a diet that was initially designed to treat patients with epilepsy. So that's where it came from. Um, it is a therapeutic diet that was used um, in place of or in conjunction with medications in um, children with seizures. So that's initially where it came from. Um, it then expanded, obviously, into the space outside of epilepsy, and people are using it to change the way their body metabolizes glucose, essentially. And so what happens is we, what people do is they follow a very low carbohydrate diet. So usually keto is less than 20 grams of carb a day, um, a true keto diet. That is just for all those non-diabetics out there that are listening. That's like less than- It's a piece of fruit. Yeah. It's honestly like (laughs) one slice of bread. Yeah. Not a lot. And then if we're truly counting, it can be things like um, vegetables even. Most people don't eat things that present like a slice of bread or fruit. Um, (laughs) They're getting their carbohydrates from vegetables. So- (laughs) That being said, when you do that consistently, it changes, and I'm not going to go into super scientific detail, but it changes the way that your body is receiving its glucose because you're not getting it directly from food, so you're getting it broken down from storage because you can't live without glucose. And in doing that, when you're breaking down fat and protein for energy, um, which changes to glucose, you break down what's called ketone bodies, which is where the diet got its name, and your brain can use some of that for energy as well. And so there's, from a cardiovascular standpoint, I don't think we have had enough long-term data, and I know there's going to be arguments in that space, but there's not a lot of people that successfully stay on a keto diet for life. 
Um, and that's really in order to keep sort of that metabolic pathway working in that direction, you have to stay on this diet. When you come in and out of it, you stop producing the ketones and you're sort of not getting the benefit, um, the benefit that may be there. Um, <laughs> and so that's sort of the space where I, I work from a sustainability standpoint and bouncing around on different diets, weight cycling, any of that kind of stuff is not necessarily healthy for our bodies. So whatever you can do in a long-term sustainable way seems more reasonable to me. Yeah. Um, but back to the keto thing. So if we had some more long-term data, we'd have a better answer to whether or not the cardiovascular benefit or risk is there. The short-term data that exists, and short-term is probably back to 10 years, um, looks okay in the cardiovascular space. Um, it doesn't look terrible as we would expect um, from, and again, how do people follow a keto diet? So when they choose their proteins and fats, are they choosing more um, cardiovascular healthy fats? So mono, poly, or are they eating, you know, more saturated fat, which I think is the big difference. Um, and so that's not consistent, right? Because there's no recommendation in that part of it. Right. So I think that's where you things get very muddled. Nutrition research is complicated enough. And anytime we change, like, you know, unless it's super regulated in a lab, everybody's eating free world. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, you can have somebody who's only eating bacon and eggs every day following mm -hmm. keto, and you can have someone who's eating fish and vegetables. Right. Those two diets are very different. So the cardiovascular benefit is going to be very different. Both of those are likely to produce um, ketones. Which, so for those who are listening who aren't familiar with the keto diet, we're not talking about diabetic ketoacidosis. Correct. Um, I think that's a really important thing that I probably should have mentioned before. But yeah. So one that's, is, yeah, go ahead. You're the, no, you're the I was just going to say, so the tricky part of that is the ketones you're producing look the same. So you're not going to be able to test for ketoacidosis with like a ketone test strip because you are going to be producing ketones. But the acidosis that occurs from lack of insulin that is – um, signature for diabetic ketoacidosis is not there. Okay. So, sorry, I'm like confused already. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. No, no, you're doing great. I just, I think I kind of black out when I hear the word ketone regardless. <laughs> it's a, <laughs> Fair it's enough. a scary word for me like, in any way, which is something sure. I'm working on for sure. But yeah. um, so I guess there are also different ways to test though for the keto diet, the key keto diet versus ketones like you're usually not using they make special ketone test strips for the diet versus um the urine ones that we use I guess okay so I don't I know. may be less familiar with that no well they do and they don't I I've, I'm getting into dangerous territory because I only know what PR people pitch me for work and there are certain ones that are different but um, I also have no idea how any of that works. So for everyone who's really into the keto diet, this is not – keep living your life. You do you. <laughs> I uh, am getting into hot water right now. But um, I think it's – for me, my, my thoughts on the keto diet are I know that I have to be more careful about my – uh, saturated fat intake because my cholesterol is a little high, um, which is very common for people with diabetes. Um, and it's not necessarily that I'm eating a high fat diet. I think that as we know, there's a lot of stress and crazy things going on in the world these days that can contribute to that. But um, I just, something that I found really interesting was that coconut oil is always kind of touted as this super healthy, like healthy fat oil or at least that's how I was interpreting it. And I think that that is not necessarily true. And that's a big part of the keto diet that always confused me. Um, can I just ask you about coconut oil real quick? Absolutely. Yep. So yes, coconut oil is what we call a tropical oil essentially, but it is a saturated fat. Um, for years, what the thought was, and still sort of the thought is it's a different type of saturated fat than what you would find in red meat or butter, for example. So there's different types of fatty acids and coconut oil has a different fatty acid than butter, just to sort of separate the two. And that's why there was less um, fear or less worry about coconut oil cardi causing cardiovascular risk or raising cholesterol. Um, the reality that's been shown in the science is that it still has an impact on 
the cholesterol, similar to other saturated fats. Maybe a bit less so, but certainly not to make it um, harmless. And so the thought is if you are concerned about cardiovascular risk or watching cholesterol levels, which, you know, 90% of the population probably should be at least tuning in a little bit. Um, (laughs) Not 90% of the population with diabetes, but all of us should be a little conscious of what we're putting in our bodies. Right. Um, That coconut oil should be used in moderation and not as like the exclusive fat that we use in our diets. Um, And that's sort of the thought there. Gotcha. And to that end, like, does everybody need to be super conscious about their diet 24-7? Absolutely yeah. not. So I'm not right. implying that. But <laughs> This has been a, a mostly diet-heavy conversation because I feel like I just used this 35 minutes to ask you my burning questions, even though, or totally things fine. that I learned uh, from you in my, in our time working together that I was just kind of like, were wow moments that I never really considered. But um, for those listening that want a really great resource, Amanda's um, Amanda's Instagram, but also her website, Nutrition Perspective. Her Instagram's at Amanda Kerpich. I will spell that for you in the comments. Um, <laughs> I uh, can't thank you enough, Amanda. This has been a really great conversation. I know Miriam's sad she had to miss out. But um, yeah, I mean, I think that the biggest takeaway I want people to get from this episode is that Although diet and um, nutrition, I should say, not diet, nutrition is a big aspect of diabetes. It doesn't have to rule your life as a diabetic. And there are great resources out there that want to help you and that can help you achieve your goals, whether that is, you know, time and range or um, something from a more nutritious, nutritious perspective. Nutrition, words are hard for me today. Uh, but um, people like Amanda exist and they are out there to help you. And even though they're pancreatically capable, they know a ton about diabetes. So thank you, Amanda. I really appreciate it. I'd love to have you back on when Miriam's back because I know she has plenty of burning questions. Absolutely. I'd be happy um, to answer them. Yeah. yeah. So no one like flood Amanda's DMs. I'm like worried that people are going to be like, <laughs> no asking worries. You I'm happy these. to hear from people. Uh, but she is a really great resource and she has her own business that she can work with you. So yeah. her website for that is nutritionperspective.com. And I already plugged your Instagram. So follow us where we will be tagging Amanda in the episode um, at pancreas underscore pals on Instagram, on Facebook at pancreas pals PP. Slide into our DMs on both. Either we love hearing from you guys. Uh, hit us up via email with any questions or um, episode suggestions at pancreaspals123 at gmail.com. You can listen to us anywhere you find you found this podcast already. But um, again, Amanda, thank you for taking Absolutely. time out of your very busy schedule and COVID times. And yeah, I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Have a great week, everyone. <laughs>